Presenting Curtis Martin for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Bill Parcells. Uh, can I can I hear that one more time? All these Steeler fans out here. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you all. It's been a long night, and uh, thank you for your patience and your support for everybody up here on this stage. Um, I also want to thank uh, Cortez Kennedy for uh, you know speaking so long that God decided to turn the lights out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know something, I, I learned so much this weekend. Uh, uh, something I didn't know, and, and just excuse me for one second, it has nothing to do with the Hall of Fame right now, but Willie Rofe, can you stand up for one second? All right, you see how big this man is? So we come in on Thursday, and we're all sitting around, and, and this big dude right here, ima imagine this guy's so big, he said, hey y'all, let's, um, let's, let's go get some Manny Petties and go get a facial. I said, what? Are you man? Nobody gonna get so all right. I, I, I'm sorry, Rolf. I told you I was gonna pick on you about that. Um well well listen, uh this is this has just been unbelievable for me. And I and I'll tell you this, I came into Canton this week, and everyone here who knows me, this section, everyone here knows me, uh, you know that I was I was never a football fan. I wasn't the type of guy to watch football. Uh, I, I, you know, I could probably count on my one hand how many football games I've watched from beginning to end in my lifetime. Uh, and also, you know, a, a, another thing about me is that I played running back, and I'm up here because of how many yards I ran. And uh, I'm, everyone who knows me also knows that I hate to run. I don't like to run at all. I box now to stay in shape just because I don't want to run anywhere. You know. Um, but this has been uh, an, an incredible road for me. I, and when I'm in situations like this, especially when I'm being honored for something that I've achieved in football, it always makes me feel a little awkward and, and out of place because you know, I, I've just never really been able to identify with the love and the passion that a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the other uh, alumni of the Hall of Fame uh, uh, that they have. I mean. Most of these guys have, have lived for the game of football and, you know, eat, breathe, sleep football. And I was someone who was somewhat forced to play football. Um, you know, uh, I can remember draft day like it was yesterday. And my family and I were sitting around and we're, we're watching the draft and the phone rings and it's Bill Parcells. Uh, you know, I answer the phone, I say hello and Parcells says, uh, Curtis, we want to know if you're interested in being a New England Patriot. And I said, um, well, y yes, yes, sir. Um, and we hang up the phone. As soon as we hang up the phone, I turn around to everyone and I said, oh my gosh, I do not want to play football. <laughs> no, you laughing, but this is, this is real, this is the truth. You know, I turn around, I say, I, I don't want to play football. I don't even know that I like football enough to try to make a career out of it. And uh, my pastor at the time was a guy by the name of Leroy Joseph, and I'm so glad he was there to talk some sense into me. Uh, so he says, Curtis, look at it this way, man. He said, um, maybe football's just something that God's given you to do all those wonderful things that you say you want to do for other people. And I'll tell you, it was like a light bulb came on in my head. That became my connection with football. And I don't know if he wouldn't have said that to me if football would have got out of me what it got out of me. I definitely wouldn't be standing here. You know, and, and ever since he said that, I knew that the only way I was gonna be successful at this game called football was if I played for a purpose that was bigger than the game itself because I knew that the love for the game just wasn't in my heart. Uh, but, but, but let me say this, this weekend, and, I, and I'll tell you this, and this is God's honest truth. I came up here, I had 
a chance to spend time with the older guys and the guys who have been inducted. I've got, I had a chance to listen to their experience. On Friday morning, we went and we listened to uh, Ralph Wilson speak and just the passion that he had for this game, being one of the founders of this, uh, you know, one of the fa founding fathers of this game, there was something that rubbed off on me. And, and literally yesterday, I really felt like it was my first day as a fan of the game of football. Thank you. Let, let me tell you a little bit about how I, I, I got started playing. So, you know, I grew up in a, a, a pretty bad neighborhood, but the household that I lived in was even worse. You know, um, my, uh, you know, I had a father who, I mean, I love him dearly, and he's passed and gone on, and I mean, he was my guy before he died. But when I was five years old, I remember watching him torture my mother. I mean, literally, and listen, I, I don't necessarily have notes, so I'm gonna kind of bear my soul and just bear with me. But, uh, you know, I, I remember him watching, watching him torture you, mom. He had, he had my mother locked in the bathroom, had her sitting on the edge of the tub, and he turned on all the hot water and stopped the tub up so that the hot water would eventually flow on her legs. And he dared her to move. And as the hot water flowed up and started going on her legs and going on her feet, and she would, just flinch a little bit, he would rush into the bathroom, take her hair and burn it with a lighter. And, you know, he'd come back out, watch her some more. She'd move again. He'd go in there with a cigarette and put cigarette burns all over her legs, what she still bears to this day. And, you know, I've seen him, uh, you know, beat her up like she was a man. I've seen him throw her down the steps. I've, I've, I've witnessed this woman go to, uh, Hey, they got, they got a bet on whether I'm a cry or not, so I'm holding in, all right? <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I, you know, I watched my mother uh, get punched in the face, have a black eye, and then go to work with makeup on just to support our family. You know, uh, you know I, 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 I've watched this. Uh, um, she did everything to raise me and in hindsight you know when you're a kid and your mother's tough on you you don't necessarily understand why you know i used to think it was because my dad was so tough on her that it would just naturally make her tough on me you know i heard the same one time that says hurt people hurt people and my mother was dealing with so much hurt and pain and <clears throat> i know that she had to um take some of that out uh, somewhere, and um, I, you, Mom, I'm so grateful that I was there for you to even take some of that pain out on, because you deserve it. <laughs> you know, um, by the time I was five, my, my, my dad was gone, and um, my mother, because we couldn't afford it, you know, she would work two and three jobs, she tied a shoestring around my neck with a key and taught me how to come in the house. I come home from kindergarten and first grade almost for two years and stay in the house by myself till like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And my mother said it just broke her heart every single day. Walking up those steps, you know, we lived in sort of a, a low income housing project type of environment. And I would always be sitting in that front window because I was scared. I was so petrified of being in the house by myself Especially, I didn't even watch Scooby-Doo. You know, I was, I was that scared. I didn't even, I, the ghosts on Scooby-Doo scared the heck out of me. Um, but, uh, you know, my mother made a way for me to start staying in between her and my grandmother. And by the time, when I was nine, uh, my mother, she walks into my grandmother's bedroom and found her murdered found her murdered with a knife in her chest. I mean, it was, and her neck was broken and everything. And uh, eyes wide open, blood everywhere. And for me as a little kid, you know, all the other family, they come in and, you know, you hear the whispers from adults as a little kid and, and they affect you a certain way. And I, I just heard everyone saying, 
You know, if that happened to me, I would go crazy. I would lose my mind. And for me, crazy was kind of like what my dad was. So in my mind as a nine-year-old, my mother told me the only thing that got her through that was that I came up to her and I grabbed her hand and I said, Mom, are you going crazy? And she said, looked down at me and said, no. Why you ask me that? And I just said, um, well, that's good because if you go crazy, <clears throat> nobody's going to be here to take care of me. And uh, I'm so grateful to my mother. Uh, that is the strongest individual that I've, I've ever known. And I appreciate her so much. And if, if all those things, and the story gets better, but just for right now, just, just entertain me. Uh, if that wasn't a work, enough on my mother, when I was 13, her sister, who was like my other mother, uh, died, got killed and died an even worse or more painful death than my grandmother did. And even through that, my mother stayed strong and raised me. By the time I was 15, growing up in the environment that I was in, I had so many brushes with death. And I remember one distinct time, you know, a guy had a gun in my head, you know, loaded gun in my head, pulled the trigger seven times. God's honest truth, the bullet didn't come out. Uh, he wasn't pointing the gun at me and pulled the trigger and the bullet came out. You know, I was too young to even recognize that God was saving my life. So, you know, you get to, by the time I'm in high school, and by this time, I'm, I'm a full-fledged product of my environment. Uh, I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Um, but, uh, you know, my mother comes to me and she says, Kurt, listen, uh, your grandmother's gone, my sister's gone, you've had so many brushes with death yourself. I'm just gonna tell you this, Kurt. Um, I want you to do something after school. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be football, baseball, basketball, join the glee club, join the band, whatever it may be. Just do something so you're not in this neighborhood 24 hours a day, just to take up two extra hours of your time. Um, she said, because if something happens to you, they might as well kill me too, because you're the only thing that I'm living for. And mom, I, I thank you so much for the sacrifices that you've made for me. You know, um, I wasn't persuaded on football. I thought I was a better baseball player, so I thought I'd probably end up playing baseball, but it was too hot in the summer, so I was like, no, nah, no baseball. You know, basketball, I was just like, well, I'm only, you know, at most I'll probably grow to be six foot. I'm, I'm not that great to be a six foot point guard in the NBA. And at the same time, my gym teacher was my, was the head football coach. His name's Mark Whitgarner, he's here. and. He says to me, he comes up to me while we're in school. He says, son, I want you to play for our football team. And I said, well, I don't really have an interest, coach. He said, um, well, listen, if you don't do something with your life, from what I hear about you, you're gonna end up dead or in jail pretty soon. And uh, with him in one ear and my mother in the other ear, football just became the default that I fell into. And Coach Mark Whitgunner, you have no idea uh, what you were saying to me, but I believe what you said could have been the, 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 the possible thing that saved my, my life. And I think you were right. He also told me, he said, you know what, Curtis, if you play, I think you'll get a scholarship. I think you're that good. You'll get a scholarship to any, anywhere you want to go in the country. But for me, it just, I didn't really care. It didn't make sense, you know, because it was like, no, now that's two things that I don't like, football and school. You know, so <laughs> I wasn't really for that. But again, to appease my mother, I played football. I ended up doing well in high school. In my senior year, I, I broke just about every Russian record. And just like Coach Mark Wickhorner said, every school in the country uh, recruited me. And I ended up having to go to college, reluctantly. And because Pitt was right down the street, I chose Pitt by default.
I'm, I'm so grateful to uh, Coach Sal Sinceri and Coach Paul Hackett because my freshman year, uh, they were the ones who kind of kept me straight. Um, just to fast forward uh, to me going into the NFL, well, even before that, by the time I was a junior, my life was so bad. I literally thought, and again, this is something that everyone knows, I always thought I would die before I was 21. So when I was 20 years old, uh, I just said, you know what? I got to go to the nearest church. And I had never went to church. My mother ra never raised me talk, you know, telling me about God or anything. But I just said, I got to go to the nearest church and tell this God, God, thank you. Because I know I'm not faster than a bullet. You know, I'm not Superman. Uh, but somehow, I've seemed to have had more than nine lives. And I remember, and this is, it was one of the most surreal moments in my life. I remember sitting there after the preacher had preached his sermon, and I'm up in the balcony, and everyone was getting up leaving, and I just sat there. And I looked up at the ceiling, and I said, you know, and, and I was, at that time, I was a street guy, so I looked up and talked to God like he was one of my boys in the street. You know, I said, uh, listen, man, I don't know nothing about you or this Jesus cat that everybody talk about, but um, I'm gonna make a deal with you. I've heard about people making deals with the devil, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to make a deal with you. And if you let me live past 21, um, dude, I promise that I'll, I'll just try to do my best, and I'll try to live right, and I'll try to do whatever you want me to do. I know you're a smart person if you're God, and so there has to be a bigger purpose for my life than what I'm experiencing. There's got to be more to life than this. And I'll tell you what, um, I'm 39 years old now, and... God has definitely upheld his end of the bargain, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to do mine, Hold my, up, uphold my end of the bargain. Um, back to football. Um, let, me, let me just tell you some, some uh, parcel-isms, I like to call them, because I tell you this, this guy has taught me and, and, and another thing, like, you know, even though I didn't initially like playing football or anything, as I played, I began to understand that football was shaping me as a man. And it was like I was learning about life through football. And it was like, it was the first time in my life that I ever committed to something and stuck to it. It was the first time that I worked hard, like really gave my all towards something because I didn't want to squander the opportunity that I had. But Parcells, I mean, there's so many Parcells stories, and I'm not going to tell them all because I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, well, that's a foregone conclusion. But um, uh, I'll never forget him. I, I was injured one day, and it was really bad. And I, and I go to him, and I say, you know, Parcells was like my consigliere. Isn't that what they call it in the mob? Like, so, so I would always call him when I was making big decisions. And I call him, I say, Coach, uh, my knee is really killing me. I don't know that I can play with it. Um, and he said, Curtis, well, listen, I would always, I'm a big fan of you taking care of your body first. Um, he said, but I've always believed one thing, Curtis. I said, what's that, coach? He said, you should, ne you know, that voice Parcells has, you should never come out of the huddle because you never know who's going in the huddle. And, and that was just something that stuck with me, you know? And, and again, that's one of the lessons that the NFL taught me. You're always replaceable. You know, there's, some, <laughs> there's someone always right on your heels. And every year, I'll tell you, there was someone, and I'm not being modest, there was someone on that team that had more ability. They were bigger, stronger, faster, quicker. But I just outworked everyone. Uh, Another, another Parcell story because you, you gotta understand, this guy has really been, he was the first male that I had as a positive role model and I really looked up to him and I hung on to every word he said. One day we're in practice and he calls me off the field. So I go over to the sideline and I say, hey, what's up coach? And um, he's like, you know, and he called me Boy Wonder. So he said, Boy Wonder, have you been working hard? I said, oh yeah, of course coach. I mean, you know, that's just what I do. I mean, like, I, I, I want to outwork everybody in the building, not just the players. I mean, the janitors, the, you know, front office people, everybody. 
And I said, but why would you ask me that? He said, um, I just want to make sure you're not fooling yourself. I said, all right, now, what does that one mean? And he said, um, boy, wonder, as long as you live, man, never forget this. There's a big difference between routine and commitment. He said, some people just do the same routine over and over again in life. And he said, and some people even get better at that same routine over and over in life. But there's few people who commit to the next level. And I'll tell you, that left an impression on me that even though I knew I, I worked hard, it made me work harder. And I applied that principle to every facet of my life, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, however it may have been, I'm always trying to commit to the next level. Thank you, Coach Parcells. Um, uh, you know, one, one, all right, this is one last football story, I promise. Um, it's just a funny one. I, I remember, you know, that whole not coming out of the huddle thing, you know, I was jealous of any other running back that stepped foot in that huddle. I didn't want anyone else going in there. And um, uh, we're playing the Raiders one day, and my fullbacks are here. They knew, like, the, the rule was, if you see me laying on the ground, because I usually pop right back up after I get hurt, I'm like, if you see me laying on the ground, I'm probably dazed or knocked out or something. Come pick me up and shake me. And uh, so we're in the Raiders. We're playing the Raiders, and I get hit downfield. I pop up, and, but I, I realize everything is black. You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm kind of knocked out. So I'm trying to hold on to people, and I finally make my way back to the huddle. And I'm standing in the huddle for a while, and I just have my hands on my hip. And the guy turns around and he says, what are you doing? And I like, you know, looked again. I was in the Raiders huddle. You know, I thought, I thought that I was just, I thought that it was just black because it hasn't, I hadn't come back to yet, but I was in the Raiders huddle, so. Well, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, football has taught me so much. I'll forever be grateful to this game. I wish I could go back and play my career with the perspective of football that I have now. You know, I was asked by um, a reporter earlier this week, uh, you know, I, I was asked if I would allow, if I would allow my child to play uh, football. And I said, well, you know, football is getting bigger, stronger, faster, tougher, you know. I don't know. I would probably be reluctant. But I'll tell you, if my kid can learn what I learned from this game, I let him play. I think it's worth the risk. At the end of the day, um, you know, I, I've achieved a lot of things, and, and I've done a lot of wonderful things in life that I'm so grateful for. But I'll tell you, my greatest achievement in my life was helping my mother and nurturing my mother from the bitter, angry, beaten, hurt person that she was, nurturing her to be a healthy, to have a healthy mindset and to forgive my father for everything that he did to her. By the time it was like, that's my greatest accomplishment. By the time he died, she was cooking him food every day and taking it to him. I mean, I mean, and she is so happy right now and I'm so grateful for it. Um, but, you know, out of all the things that I achieved, one of the things that I learned is that it's not necessarily what you achieve in life that matters most, but it's who you become in the process of those achievements that really matters. In closing, there's just a couple of people that I would like to also thank. Um, again, uh, Derry Stone, this is a guy who's been like my father figure and he's been the person who has taken the place of just about everyone else, every male role model in my life. You've been the best person for me to look up to. I honor and I respect you, and I'm, the reason why I'm the man that I am today is because of what you taught me, Derek. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank my Beautiful, beautiful wife. I just got married a couple years ago. And 
we have a little seven-month-old named Ava. And honey, I'd just like to thank you. Um, and can I just have one thing? Can I have all my ex-teammates, whether you were in Pitt, New England, or the Jets, can I just have you stand up for one second? You guys, I just want you to know that you guys are like the brothers I've never had. Many of you have, have carried me. You've taught me so much. In, 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 our, in our class meeting rooms, it was always funny because I never really understood the X's and O's of football, so people always made fun of me. Uh, but you guys, I really appreciate you all, and I appreciate every coach and everyone who has had anything to do with my playing career. Thank you. I would also like to thank the owners that I played for, uh, Mr. Kraft, uh, uh, the, Hess, the Hesses, and uh, Mr. Woody Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Kraft, you've been, you've been great to me. Um, you know, you guys used to invite me over to your house to eat, and I really appreciate that. Mr. Johnson, you still continue to help me in my uh, life after football with all the business things that I'm doing, and I really appreciate you both. And if, if I could, um, I mean, I really wish that I could ask God to stand up right now because I'll tell you this, I'm not living, uh, I'm not breathing, my life is nothing without God. And I'm probably one of the most humble, I'm so grateful and so appreciative for what God has done in my life. Um, and last but not least, I'd just like to thank all the fans. You know, um, when, I, when I realized that football was a vehicle, I used it to impact people's lives and do positive things. Uh, but I also used football as a vehicle to reach fans and speak to fans and get to know you all because uh, a, a lot of what you all do, you just don't know how much it means to us on the field. So thank you all. You know, at my, at my eulogy, I don't want my uh, daughter or whoever it may be giving my eulogy to talk about how many yards I gained or touchdowns I scored. I want my daughter to be able to talk about the man that Curtis Martin was, how, you know, when she was growing up, she looked for a man who was like her father, that he was a man of integrity, a man of strong character, and a God-fearing man. That's what I want. And then at the end of the day, she say, oh, yeah, he was a pretty good football player. Thank you all.